G'day and thank you for joining us for the Gospel Truth, where we take the Blue Letter Bible's list of parallel passages to investigate quotations from the Jewish Bible found in the Christian New Testament. G'day, Jason. G'day. We're up to, um, what is this, uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 to 18, right? Yep. Okay. Um, this this really uh, goes, it follows on really from verse 12, mm. um, the... Uh, the, the, the wise men that came to, um, you know, throw presents at Jesus, uh, not at his birth, but, you know, sometime after he was born. And uh, on the way to um, say good day, they tipped off Herod and said, this is what we're going to go and do. Apparently there's a new king and you're not it. Sucked in. <laughs> and um, Herod said, well, you know, when you find him, come and tell me because I'd like to throw some gifts at him too. Yeah, and we have, uh, a, we have a whole video about that and you can see that by following the little question mark that's up in the corner of the screen now. Ooh, bing. Hmm. Uh, but verse 12, then being uh, divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, a dream like that would have been valuable on the way through. But anyway, uh, they departed for their own country another way. Now we get to verse 16, and um, uh, the bit that we just jumped over, there's a video for that as well, by the way. But mm. getting to verse 16, uh, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived, oh, you know what? I usually read this with my um, Anglican uh, that's, minister voice. That's right. But, but you know what? I reckon I reckon that maybe you should do this in your used car salesman voice because you know <laughs> I enjoy it so much. <laughs> okay. and I, and I shouldn't be the only one to do an accent. Come on. Uh, two sixteen down to two eighteen. Or just the 216? Yeah, yeah, 1618, why not? All right. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this, okay. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of all the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof. Coasts? Now, <laughs> I don't remember there being like a big beach trade in Bethlehem. Coasts? All right. I can't even read it and laugh at the same time. <laughs> Hang on. And then all the, no, no, where are you up to? Halfway through 2.16, it says, and in all the coasts thereof. Really? Yeah. I mean, okay, so I've got, no, wait, I've got, um, Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise man, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth to put the death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, and in all its districts. Oh, you've ah, got coasts. So, right. so boundaries, I suppose, is probably mm -hmm. there. Okay, From two years old and under, according to all the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men so he's basically going to go and uh, slay and again this text says all the children just doesn't pick out just the males all the children although maybe when this was written the only children that had any value were the males and they assumed that was what they were talking about uh, okay <clears throat> 217 then was fulfilled that which was spoke of by jeremy the pro i'm not joking <laughs> You got Jeremy in here. I'm on the Blue Letter Bible's own version, and it says Jeremy. Cool. I love that. What version is this? Uh, it must be. Uh, I'm it's assuming King it's the King James. It's the King James version, and they have Jeremy. Yeah. I love that. A prophet Jeremy, my old buddy Jeremy. All right. <clears throat> then was fulfilled that was which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, "In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning." Rachel weeping for her children, which would not be comforted because they are not. And then it goes on. The herald was dead and an angel came to Joseph in Egypt and said, you can ship it back up now. You're all good. Yep. But we <laughs> okay. are particularly talking about that line, uh, Matthew 2.18. That uh, quote from Jeremiah, not mm. Jeremy. I love that. Just... <laughs> oh, man. Oh, how man, how has it funny. been? This far in, and we've read so many translations, and I've never noticed... Is that like the normal in King James Bibles, Jeremy? <laughs> I don't I really it's don't so, know. It's so, like, disrespectful. Oh. It's like calling the Queen, Queenie. I Jeremy. love that voice. That's one of my favourite accents of all time. It's yeah. just so funny. Okay, um, so mm. now, okay, so what I want to know is... Oh, okay, so Herod, Herod said, oh, you know, they tricked me, wanted to go kill the baby, but now I have to kill all the babies. Yeah. Uh, so go and kill all the babies under two years old. So they did that, and um, and so and, and the reason why that was done was so that, according to the writer of Matthew, that it would be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremy, saying yada yada yada. Now, now this got, so 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 I've, they're claiming this is a fulfillment, right? Mm. This is the fulfillment according to the writer of Matthew, right? Yeah, that would imply that somewhere in Jeremiah there is this verse. 
And the context mm. of this verse is that a whole generation of children is going to be slaughtered and that Rachel, knowing this was going to happen, wept about mm. it. That's wept what that it. implies. And, and, that, and that there was, this, this is a prophecy that obviously hasn't, th- there was no fulfillment, you know, back in the time of Jeremiah, mm-hmm. but it came to fruition here and now in, uh, you know, in the time of Jesus, right? Yep. So, okay, that's that's because <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, you know, everyone's listening going, well, yeah, duh. but I mean, that's that's what a prophecy is. There's some, God speaks through a prophet and says, you know, this. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes there is a, um, a, a forward prediction of an event. And uh, and then that event actually occurs in the future. There's some, it might be very immediate or it might be, you know, some distance away. There's a lot of prophecy we know that hasn't been fulfilled as yet. Mm. Um, and when it is fulfilled, then it's fulfilled. But when that when that event occurs, we go, ah, oh, there it is, it was spoken, you know, by the prophet. So we go back to the prophet, we go to Jeremiah and, you know, Christians love this chapter. This is Jeremiah chapter thirty one, right? Yeah, it's one of my actually one of my favorite parts too, because we, we talk about this thing, the new covenant. Uh, mm. And this is the um, stomping ground of that new covenant wave. This is where it all comes in and kicks off, and you can go from, from like twenty seven, twenty eight, all the way through to the end um, mm. of um, thirty one. And it's just this amazing picture of the tribes being regathered, and Israel becomes its uh, own people again, and God's in control again. And not only for the tribes, but for everyone else. Everyone knows who God is, what God does, and we're all pointing in the same direction. So. Um, what I just, you know, let me just read the the study note that I have here uh, from my New King James Study Bible, as I usually do. This is uh, so verse eighteen. It says, "This is what it says." Um, it says, "This prophecy comes from Jeremiah thirty one fifteen, check, in which Rachel, who had been entombed near Bethlehem some thirteen centuries before the Babylonian captivity." is seen weeping for her children as they were led away to Babylon in 1586 uh, BCE. Uh, okay, we would agree with that, right? Yep, that's fair. So the, the, the study notes give it away. Now, when you, when you get to um, Jeremiah 31, 15, and I'll, and I'll read it from here, you know, thus says the Lord, a, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Study note, um, uh, Rachel's bitter weeping was caused by the exile and captivity of her children. She refused to be comforted in her sorrow sorrow and loss. Again, we would agree with that, right? Yeah, and what people might want to do now is, it's not very long and it's a really great thing, is start reading Jeremiah 31 at verse 1. Because what we're doing is we're jumping into the middle of a story. Hmm. We are. That's what's happening in 15. We're plopping into the middle. And it's kind of like walking into a, maybe into a bar or something. And there's a guy on the floor and he's laid out. And um, there's another guy standing up and he's got blood on his knuckles. And you think, oh, wow, man, he just totally knocked that guy down. We well, you, you don't know what happened before he came in. There could have been any number of reasons why that guy either deserved to get knocked down or he knocked himself <laughs> out. I mean, so many different analogies yeah. you could have used, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a guy lying on the floor in the middle of a pub, and another guy with. Anyway. I'm in Ireland. This is like an everyday <laughs> event. But, but what the point is here is that the Jeremiah in this passage is preaching how hmm. all of the people that were lost in exile that are still in exile because this is the northern tribes he's talking about. They're, they're gone. He's saying that they're going to come back and that God's going to reclaim his relationship with uh, Ephraim, the Norman tri- northern mm. tribes. Israel's going to be a, a virgin again. They're going to, um, you know, the, the virgin's going to dance and the old men and young men are going to dance and it's going to be a great time and everyone's happy again. But Rachel can't accept that news. She's still crying. And if we go on to 31.16... It says, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded. The things that you've done will be rewarded, saith the Lord. And they will come again from the land of the enemy, saying, like, no, stop your crying. They're going to come back. Yeah. Now, and it goes you- on in 17. There is hope in, in your future, says the Lord, that uh, your children shall come back to their own border. Mm. All right. Okay. Um, so, but now, 
But um, we should be able to flip that around, right? We should be able to take 3115, yeah. read that, knowing the context now that it was done in, and put that back into Matthew, and it should still make sense. But it doesn't. Yeah, but it doesn't. Now, well, this is the thing, because, I mean, now, the, as, I, as I just read, the study note on, uh, on, the, on the verse in Matthew says, oh, no, this is, this is really what it's about. It's about, you know, the uh, exile and Babylon mm. and so on and so forth. And then you go to the study note in Jeremiah in the New King James Study Bible again, and it says, yeah, yeah, you know, this is what it's about. It's really about, you know, the, the weeping because of the um, exile and all that sort of stuff. And uh, and then you go, well, hang on. So that means that this so-called prophecy, it's not even really a prophecy. It's kind of a, it's a, it, it's a, like a, a poetic, figurative. Yeah, it's a poetic yeah. statement on, on, the, on the spirit of, the, of uh, Israel at the time. Yeah. And the spirit was saying, yeah, I, know, I know what you're saying, Jeremiah, and it sounds great, but they're not here. That's what, you yeah. know, you can say what you it's want, not but I'm still if, here. It's yeah. not as if we've got some sort of zombie Rachel that's come out of her tomb and there she is actually weeping. We're, we're not literal here. Yeah. This is figurative. Um, but that aside, let's say it's a prophecy. Uh, the, the, the literal fulfillment of that prophecy was the, was the exile, right? Mm. That, yeah. That was worth, the fulfillment. It's worth mentioning that when the text says that they shall come back from those borders again, mm. it's talking about the physical descendants of those people that were lost in the exile. That's what mm. that's talking about. But Matthew, if this verse is pertinent to Matthew, those children can't have physical descendants. They're, so even if you did say, all right, well, it still, it still counts. Um, the children that were slaughtered, allegedly slaughtered by Herod, it's worth mentioning that this event is not mentioned in any non-New Testament sources, which is pretty amazing. You wipe out um, two, gen two uh, years of kids and no one mentions it. The Jewish writers, you think that mm. there'd be some great uh, uh, lamentation in the land written down in, in Jewish sources and that this would be a day that people would have had a fast day to remember. I mean, but that's not there. Um, so, but the, if, if you take this text and, and transpose it on top, there's no way that those children, those babies that died, can have physical descendants that can come, which is what the promise of the Creator is right. in the next line. Right. Uh, they, they are not a match pair. Right. So now get this. This is what it does. Now, um, to be fair, the study note in uh, Matthew does continue. So let me read what it, what it does with that to make this work. Uh, as I said, it says this prophecy comes from Jeremiah 31, 15, in which Rachel, who had been entombed near Bethlehem some 13 centuries before Babylonian captivity, is seen weeping for her children as they were led away to Babylon in you know, 568 BCE. In the, now, get this, here it is. In the slaughter of the male infants at the time of Christ's birth, uh, Rachel, once again, once again, once again, you love that? This mm -hmm. is supposed to be the fulfillment. But once again, uh, once again is pictured as mourning the violent loss of her sons. Don't you love that once again? Mm. This is supposedly the fulfillment of what Jeremiah had said. Um, evidently not. As, can we throw in quickly as well? There's, there's a couple of interesting bits in the text about Rachel. Um, so Rachel is buried in Rachel's tomb, which isn't far from Bethlehem. We've been and there. At, at, it's right. And at the time of um, at the time of Matthew, the tomb mm. was there. But if you go back in the text, I think it's in Samuel, they talk about um, Samuel one. Yeah, Samuel says, "I'm going to leave now, and I'll meet you by Rachel's tomb." And at that point, Rachel's tomb was in a slightly different place because she didn't die near Bethlehem. She died near Rama on the road, yeah. right? And it was much closer to Rama. And Rama and, um, is about 11 miles away. I mean, and that's quite a long, a long distance in the land of Israel. It's not, it's yeah. not like now you can jump in a car. You know, you want to go 11 miles, you dedicate your day to it. Um, yeah, right, yeah. And so it's, in, it's interesting that Matthew assumes that Rachel's real close um, when she wouldn't have been when this prophecy was written, which is why there was a voice in Rama and not a voice in Bethlehem. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay, so I've got that. They did, they did mention that. According to 1 Samuel 10, 2 and 3, Rachel's tomb was near uh, Zelzah, which was near Rama in Benjamin. Uh, this may, has, may have been a memorial for Rachel located in the tribal allotment and the descend, descendants of her son Benjamin 
so on and so forth. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Hmm. Hmm. So basically, you can take the Matthew verse if you like, and you could, I mean, it could say, and I don't know why it doesn't. Um, and so it's a bit like how pro- um, the, the prophecy that said that, or it's a bit like the verse that said that Rachel is crying for her children, because we're all crying for the children. Because said that, but they didn't. They said it was a prophecy, yeah. and it isn't a prophecy. Yeah, he would have got away with that had he said it. I mean, yeah, totally. you know, if he yeah. if he said that, and it's kind of like you know, reminiscent of such and such. But to say yeah. that this is a a fulfillment, the fulfillment. Yeah, that Jeremy of, said uh, it. That Jeremy said. Well, maybe it was. Maybe it was something Jeremy said, but it wasn't something Jeremy. I don't think that's, that's what right. he intended. Yeah, that's right. Maybe Jeremy might have a hidden character in here somewhere. Maybe Jeremy is the Messiah. I'm going to cut that right out. But um, Jeremy, that's hilarious. Uh, another thing, just an, another little tiny bonus, is one of our favourite verses where um, Jeremiah quotes um, uh, the, the, the same uh, parable that um, uh, Ezekiel quotes in Ezekiel mm. chapter 13 and, and 33, I think, uh, in verse 29. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but, I, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. And uh, Ezekiel, as as we often, often quote, and as uh, many of our critics hate when we quote it, uh, that Ezekiel um, uh, points out very um, specifically that someone cannot die for another person's sins. Mm. Just it can't happen. It can't. Uh, Ezekiel chapter eighteen. Are yeah, we if you've got, if you, well, if, you, if you're at home and you've got your Bible open anyway, just read to the end of um, 31. The whole, everything you need to know about the New Testament, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, everything you need to know about um, the New Testament, uh, the New Covenant, because it's really where that word comes from, uh, is right there at the end. You can just read from the grapes all the way down to the end, everything you need to know about what's going to happen when the Messiah, because it's, I mean, the whole thing we're doing at the moment on Matthew, that's all about the birth of what, who Matthew claims is the Messiah. The actual Messiah isn't the reason for the end of the end of days or the Messianic age. He's part of the Messianic age. But before that happens, this will happen from mm. Jeremiah 31. So read all that first. And then when that happens, when you look out the window and you say, oh, look, there's no more missionaries out there and everyone's kind of cool and there's no war and everyone when you loves look each on other. YouTube and you, When you look on YouTube and Jono and Jason aren't doing this anymore. Yeah. Then that's, that's what it means. Yeah. Then if verse, 30, so, verse thirty-four says, "No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them.'" Says the Lord, "For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I'll remember no more." We'll be and, then, job. and then if there's a physically anointed person sitting on a throne and governing Israel, then you have a Messiah, and we're all, all good. good. All right, we are all done. Right. We're done. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be back again next week. See you then. You know what? While we're on it, there's this great right. verse down here, Jeremiah thirty-one twenty-two. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? It's worth mentioning in Jeremiah thirty-one. Israel is Ephraim. It's Israel. They talk about Zion. It's also the begotten firstborn son and a daughter. So it's a great verse to point to people who say, "No, it definitely says he's a son." Or it definitely says he's a daughter. Or it definitely says he's a wife. Because it's mm. all of those things in Jeremiah 31. And it says, O thou backsliding daughter, for the, for the Lord has created a new thing on earth. A woman shall compass a man. And that made me think, what the frick are you talking about? In modern culture, not so much mm. now, but when I was a kid, I used to go over to my grandparents on my dad's side that lived out in the sticks. And I lived there quite a long time. Mm. And... If I was away for any period of time and went back, they would say, are you courting? That's what they'd say. And I'd go, no, I'm not courting. Was when... um, Oh. uh, Right. Are you dating someone? Yeah. Right. Now, in the olden days, a man Mm. would pick up a woman and he'd take her to court. So he would be well off and he would take her to the court of the king or the local landowner or the sheriff or whoever else owned all the land and they would do these social th- events in the evening where people networked and you show off your bride to be and that was called courting okay and that's what compass means and in the jewish wedding wow. the woman still walks around the man seven times that's a tradition now that's true. it says the lord hath created a new thing on earth a woman shall compass a man and the woman in this is Israel, and the man is um, God. 
And the reason this is a new thing for them is because they'll come looking for God and they'll court God, whereas up until now, God's courted Israel. He's always said, turn to me, I'll turn to you. And in this issue, when the backsliding daughter turns around, she's going to court God by going around God and saying, come back to me. And that's what that's that verse really means. Cool. And I hadn't looked into that before, but the, the woman shall compass a man thing. I was like, what? And uh, it led me into a little bit of digging. Wow. You should totally leave that in. That's, that's well, really maybe, interesting. I'll throw it on the end. It's bonus content. Yeah, please do. Uh, 